Home Sweet Home, the magnificent voice of Nellie Melba, recorded almost a hundred years ago. Our Dame Nellie sang like a nightingale and she had the world in raptures. Decked out in their straw boaters and their Sunday best, it all looks prosperous enough. But at the turn of the century, this country was in pretty ordinary shape. Australia was not yet a nation, just a collection of scattered and squabbling colonies. They couldn't even agree on how wide to make a railway track. Drought had killed off half our sheep and our cattle. Our wool price was going through the floor. Our banks were collapsing and our economy was in the grips of a worldwide depression. Still, the year 1900 brought with it a sense of optimism and opportunity. After all, next year, 1901, we'd become a new country. And this new century was going to be our century. Now imagine this if you can, take yourself back. It's 1901. Queen Victoria, the mother of the empire, passes away after reigning for 64 years. Across in France, the speed limit for those newfangled automobiles is set at a breathtaking six miles per hour. A 19-year-old Spaniard named Picasso holds his first art exhibition. And a Polish anarchist assassinates American President William McKinley. Meanwhile here, at the bottom of the world, a new nation is born. It's the first new nation of the 20th century and the first one to be born on film. The Commonwealth of Australia was born on January the 1st, 1901. 60,000 people turned up at Centennial Park in Sydney on that hot and windswept New Year's Day. Our first Governor-General, the very English Earl of Hopeton, read the proclamation. It had all the pomp, all the pageantry that you'd expect on such a right royal occasion. What the cameras didn't reveal was that the grand ceremonial dome and platform were not made of marble, but plaster of Paris. It seems right from the start that we weren't taking ourselves too seriously. But it wasn't long before we started making our mark. Australia's flyboys were amongst the first to conquer the skies in machines tied together with bits of fencing wire. Australia was one of the first countries to give women the vote, and that was in 1902. A couple of years later, we made this, the world's first feature film. The story of Ned Kelly and his gang. Like this little bloke, Australia was a bit overwhelmed, but going places. In 1901, who could have dreamed of the amazing success story that would be told over the next hundred years? Now one thing that sets our century apart from all others is this invention, the movie camera. It means that we can go on an amazing journey back through time. 
we can relive those unforgettable moments that changed our lives. With the camera, we can be there with Mawson in Antarctica in 1911. And watch Smithy and Ulm complete their epic flight across the Pacific in 1928. We can witness the courage of our boys on the Kokoda track. And the bravery of Australians during the worst disasters. We can cheer our dawn to another gold medal. Watch the Don take the crease and be ringside as Lionel Rose defends his world crown. There's the final bell, the end of a great title fight. <laughs> but what sets this series apart from all the others is this little fellow. The home movie camera is a reflection of how we've made it through and lived our century. And it's quite surprising who you'd sometimes find behind the lens. Even Prime Ministers, like Sir Robert Menzies, like to focus and film. Shy? Well, of course they are. After all, it's something to pose for a Prime Minister. During World War II, Mr Menzies was away for months on end. Yet he always returned with some pictures to show the family. But it's the home movies of less famous people that tell us who we really are. It's 1923. A doting dad films the baby's first steps. And when young Reg saddled up for his first trip to school, Mum had the camera handy too. The city of Kempsey proudly puts on a parade. And somebody films it. Fish float and all. And the camera shows us as we are. A bit shy. A bit awkward. And sometimes a bit silly. But having a lot of fun in this century of ours. I'm the daughter of a digger Who thought the father owed The girl Now, it takes all types to make a country as culturally diverse as Australia. And while there are the obvious similarities with the rest of the world, we are at times a weird mob. Take this bloke, for example. He is as mad as a cut snake. And a poisonous snake at that. In the days before television, before the internet and computer games, Aussies flocked to see George Cann at his famous snake show. In 1924, 350,000 people came to see George dice with death. The snake is lethal. And to prove it, George demonstrates how one bite is enough to kill a pigeon in seven seconds flat. George himself was bitten 400 times during his reckless career. But the windmill arm is one trick he forgot to teach the unlucky bird. Still, it seemed to work for George. Posh city theatres, like this one, were reserved for upmarket overseas performers, not George. This is where you'd find him, 
down Sideshow Alley. For much of our century, this was the theatre for most Aussies. And when the show hit town, well, it was the place to be. It wasn't one show, but many. All taking place in small canvas tents at agricultural shows right across the country. By 1950, there were about a thousand agricultural societies around Australia. And they all had their annual shows. When the shows came to the big smoke, like Sydney and Melbourne, they'd bring a million people through the turnstiles every year. This type of rough and ready theatre came from the old English fairs. But when it took off here in the 1900s, it quickly stamped its own Aussie brand. They offered everything, from sword swallowers to whips. And daring dancing girls. And gave some young blokes their first chance to learn about S.E.X. And to fill the tents back in the 20s and the 30s, they searched the world to parade what they unashamedly called the best freak show. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you Princess Shubangi, Queen of the Pygmies, first appearance in Australia, direct from Africa. <laughs> the Pygmy Princess fascinated audiences around Australia for more than 30 years. It can now be revealed Princess Shubangi's real name was Maria Peters. She was neither a pygmy nor a princess. But there was one bloke in the sideshows who was fair dinkum. He was Jim Sharma. Ladies and gentlemen, the killer has never been beaten. For 60 years, the Jim Sharma boxing troupe issued the same challenge. Offering five pounds, five pounds cash to any gent who can last three rounds with five. Men and boys who wanted to be would pull on the gloves to show their girlfriends how brave or how reckless they really were. But for young Aborigines, joining a boxing troupe was one way to get off the mission and into a job in a white man's world. Until it ended in 1971, Jimmy Sharman's troupe was one place where young Aborigines could make a quid and be treated equally. It wasn't just the tent fighters who learnt their trade in Sideshow Alley. As they toured the country towns through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, the tent shows became a nursery for a generation of Aussie entertainers. Johnny O'Keefe, Lucky Grills and Slim Dusty all paid their dues in the showground tents. And what's this pair up to? He was the banjo player from Tennessee and she was the showgirl. They went on to become one of our most popular show business couples, Bob and Dolly Dyer. Good evening and welcome to television. In 1956, that cheery good evening meant goodbye to the carnival culture, the end of a colourful era in Australian life. But if you could no longer ride the wall of death at the Ecker or the country show, well, daredevils like this fellow built their own down the backyard. They're going to ride that bike round that wall. Sissy stuff? Sure, let's get this thing mechanised. Get easy, Ted. you are likely to come right out of that hole and take off like a jet bomber. I bet you didn't know that in the 1950s, 
Australia boasted a church with the world's smallest congregation. Every Sunday at 17 Mile Rocks in Queensland, this preacher man gave service to his one and only parishioner. No prizes for betting where everybody else was. Australians love sport, we always have. It's said to be our religion. Give us a lump of wood and a ball and watch a game of cricket break out. Show us a hill and we'll try to climb it. And if that's not challenging enough, then we'll invent a sport of our own. In the late 1930s, this man, daredevil Fred Pye of Sydney, had a bright idea for a new Aussie sport, shark racing. The rules were simple. Get to the far side and you win. Lose and you get eaten. The funny thing is, it never caught on. What was always a favourite was betting on two flies or a handful of colourful cockroaches. It seems that the punt is in our blood. The one time the nation slows down is for this race, the mighty Melbourne Cup. The slow motion camera shows the finish in detail. Oh, what beautiful action. The winner of this 1930 cup became an all-time legend. Not the jockey, but the horse. And how did you come to call Farlap Farlap? What does it mean? Uh, sky blink. Oh. Uh, light will, sir. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. But it seems nothing could stop him winning. Not even an attempt by two men to murder him with a shotgun while he was training for a race. Parlap won an amazing 37 of his 51 starts and he almost sent the bookies broke. Of course, every country has its heroes. But what do you say about a country that turns a racehorse into a national icon? Good luck, Parlap. Australia's with you. I'll say we are. Just two years later, it wasn't bullets, but an accidental case of arsenic poisoning while in the United States that brought Farlap's reign to an end. Oh, there may be other champions. Your memory will always be new. So what do we do with our national treasure? Well, we stuffed him. And why not? A perfect example of the taxidermist's art has restored Farlap. Farlap. Farewell to you. How often do we say it? Australia rides on the sheep's back. And here's one little boy who lived it to the letter. Now, you won't recognise him from this home movie, but he went on to become one of the dominant figures in Australian life. Another clue? Well, he became our second longest serving Prime Minister. His name? Robert James Lee Hawke. The Age of Innocence. But the year after this remarkable film was shot, Australia found itself in the Second World War of our century. The wartime newsreels were censored, of course, for our protection. Still, they kept our spirits up and gave the folks at home a glimpse of our boys at the front. And when it was thankfully all over in 1945, there was no homecoming sweeter than for the Sprod family. Captured here for all time on Home Movie. George was home for Christmas after spending three and a half years as a prisoner of war in Changi. Brother-in-law Des met his three-year-old daughter for the first time when he returned. Dan Sprod was in the Navy and the third brother John was in the Air Force. Reunited at last, it seems this formidable foursome had lost none of their larrikin streak. Now you can bet their first blizzardy cold beer never touched the sides. What you've seen tonight is a quick insight. Just a glimpse into the lives of Australians. Some famous, but mostly not. But over the coming weeks, we'll take you back. We'll remind you of who we are and just how far we've come. The stirrers 
and the stars, the lairs and the larrikins, what it means to be Australian and what makes us tick. Things you've forgotten and things that you just won't believe. Now thanks to this modern marvel here, you'll have front row seats for all of the action in our century. And I promise you'll enjoy the show.